Social expectation drowns us all inside. What you have should be what I want, 'cause what I have just ain't alright. The clothes I wear, the way I comb my hair, how I live, oh I don't care. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, adhaf ma hamidahu jamiu qalqihi. كما يحبه ويرضاه اللهم لك الحمد ولك الشكر الحمد لله على كل حال ونعوذ بالله من حال أهل النار اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما مولاي صلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم اللهم صلي على سيدنا محمد عدد ما في علم الله صلاة دائمة بدوام ملك الله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح اللهم اجعلنا دعاة إليك وإلى رسولك اللهم اجعلنا دعاة إليك وإلى رسولك اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا القرآن الحكيم ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما أما بعد. These discourses are indeed very beneficial, and they have been very beneficial to many of us in Ramadan. And I hope that these discourses benefit the people of the world also too. Shafiz dear, mashallah. This one is about a regret. On missing regular practices, there are certain regular practices that you do, which are optional, which are voluntary, and um, sometimes you miss them. It is important that you have a regret on that, as we shall soon see, inshallah. Regret on missing regular practices. Someone wrote. Someone wrote to Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi, Rahimahullah, wa nawwarallahu marqadahu, wa nafa'ana bi ulumihi, ameen. And um, Ali Gorazi, when you hear his name and AR, just remember Tana Bawan. Remember Tana Bawan and picture yourself before him, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi. Rahmatullah Someone wrote to him that the greatest disease he suffered was lack of himmat, courage, willpower, so that he could not do anything. That was his greatest disease. He lacked that so that he could not do anything. The Maulana wrote to him, whatever you can, do that. Subhanallah, advice of the elders. Whatever you can, do that. And the regret for that which you could not do will together not let you be deprived. And Fasi Isa, commentary of this by Mufti Taki Usmani, Damad Barakatum. Cure for laziness in discharge of obligations. The malady of which this man complained is found in most of us and that's so true we lack courage to do our duty the lack of courage to discharge one's duties could be of two kinds if it concerns the faraid the obligatory duties like salah fasting etc then there is no cure for that but to compel oneself to do that. No cure but to 
compel oneself to do that. So that's no choice now. We just have to compel ourselves to do that. Keeping away from sin. It is the same with clear and known sins. The lack of courage to keep away from sins must be corrected. By picturing the adab, the punishment against, and picturing the hisab, the reckoning before Allah, one must compel oneself to discharge the fard and wajib and to keep away from the prohibited and the sins. Come what may, come what may. There is no other way out for that. Lack of courage in fulfilling regular practices. The second kind concerns the voluntary choice, the voluntary forms of worship. A man discharges his obligations to the best of his ability and resists sins as best as he can, but cannot bring himself to perform the superrogatory worship, the optional worship, to which he has bound himself, like his awabin, or his tahajjud, or his zikr, just come. He cannot bring himself to that which he has bound himself. The question that the man asks pertains, when he asks Maulana, it pertains to this type of worship, voluntary forms of worship. So, what's the, what did Maulana reply? This is the gist of it. Repentance, repentance will prevent deprivation. The Maulana told this man, whatever you are able to do, you do that. Whatever you are able to do, together with the repentance and the regret and the longing for what cannot be done will not let you be deprived. Two things, Maulana said. Do what you can do. And then doing what you can do, together with the regret and the repentance and the longing for that which you couldn't do, both of them put together will not let you be deprived. The little voluntary worship that one can perform added to the regret for not being able to do what he should have done will cause him, will not cause him, not cause him to be deprived. For instance, instead of reciting the Kalima 1,000 times, Irshad, he recited it only a hundred times. Sometime after Fajr, you can't do a thousand, you can't do your twelve tasbih, you do one. Or instead of getting up late in the night for tahajjud, he offered four rakats after Isha. He offered the four rakats after Isha, but he did it, but before winter, he didn't do it before winter. Then this little this little that he does with being sorry, the little that he does with being sorry for not being able to do all will benefit him. And he will not be deprived at all, inshallah. The longing itself, that longing and regret, that longing is repentance. The repentance or the longing is itself a great thing. Wow. Allah grants against the longing and the repentance. Allah gives when that person has that longing in his heart. My honorable father, and we should pay attention how they used to respect their fathers. My honorable father, that is Mufti Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala alayhi, used to say that the longing is a rare commodity. The longing is a rare commodity. But this concerns only the voluntary worship, not concerning fars. Can't long to perform fars. The longing, it's a very rare commodity. 
No amount of longing can replace the obligatory duties. They will have to be done, come what may. Longing plus a strong excuse are means of reward. If a man's longing is backed by a strong excuse, then indeed the longing will get him the original reward. For instance, he is bedridden and cannot perform the various supererogatory worship, but longs to be able to perform them. He longs to perform, but he's sick in bed. He can't do it. Then he will be rewarded as one performing the deeds. He will get the same reward that he would receive on doing them if he was healthy. The story of Abdullah ibn Mubarak and the blacksmith. Another case is that there is no excuse for neglecting the voluntary worship, but that one lacks strength to do it. He longs for the strength to be able to do it. Can't do it because he lacks the strength to do it. But he longs now for the strength to be able to do it. Inshallah, he will not be deprived. Let's go back to the story of Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahmatullahi was a great wali. A great wali and a great alim. As I said before, Abdullah ibn Mubarak was Ustadul Asatiza of Imam al-Bukhari. He was the teacher of the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. But yet he was the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahman. When he died, someone saw him in a dream and asked him how he feared. And that's the practice of our great Mashaikh when they die. Their students, people see them in dreams. And they always, always ask them uh, this question. And of course, dreams are one fortieth of prophethood. It's a whole section in Bukhari about dreams. Kitab tabir interpretation of dreams. And about Hadith says about a ru'ya to saliha, a pious dream. Sometimes you get the pious dream yourself, and sometimes another brother sees it for you. Someone asked him how he feared. How is it? How, how did you fear? He said that Allah was very kind to him and elevated him to high ranks. However, he could not get the rank of the blacksmith who lived opposite his home. Subhanallah. We are going to a great muhaddith here and we are going to what? A blacksmith. This man was inquisitive who got the dream and traced out the house of the blacksmith which was indeed opposite the house of Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahmatullahi. He narrated his dream to the blacksmith's wife and asked her what was the deed that took her husband ahead of a man, a great wali, a great alim, a great muhaddith like Abdullah ibn Mubarak's caliber? What took him ahead? Work stopped on hearing the adhan. His wife said that all day he was engaged at his foundry in his blacksmith work but did not do any outstanding pious deed. However, he had two unique qualities. If while working, he heard the adhan, he stopped work forthwith. And if he had raised his hammer beyond his head to strike the iron, and he heard the adhan, he threw it behind him and would not bring it down on the iron. He then went to offer salat in the masjid. One quality he had. Second quality. The longing, the longing took him ahead. The second thing was that, that, that tamanna, that desire. A saint like Abdullah ibn Mubarak lived opposite their house. The blacksmith's house. So at night, <coughs> because... Many of the men of Allah, they value the night. At night, he stood on his rooftop, rooftop 
and offered Salah, offered Salah during the night. He stood erect like a stick, unmoving. The wife is saying, my husband, she said, longed to emulate him. He would wish that he had as much opportunity to engage in worship all night and he still longed to see if he could do that also. My respected father, Rahmatullah, used to say that Allah gave the blacksmith a higher rank than Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Rahmatullah, because of his longing. So the longing is indeed a great asset. Therefore, anyone who cannot observe the voluntary deeds much, if he can't do it much, should at least have a longing to do them. Then he will not deprive himself of Allah's mercy. This is what the Maulana Rahmatullah means when he says, one of our great elders used to say, Uhibbu Salihin, I love the pious people. Walastu minhum, and I am not of them. I wish I was, I long to be amongst them. La Allah yarzukuni salahan. Perhaps I hope that Allah may grant me salah and piety. Therefore, anyone who cannot observe the voluntary deeds much should at least have a longing to do them and he will not deprive himself of Allah's mercy. This is what the Maulana Rahmatullah means when he says, whatever can be done coupled with the regret for not doing the rest will not cause deprivation. These words also indicate that one may do whatever little one can do and not neglect and not neglect the complete because the complete cannot be done. So don't neglect the complete because it can't be done. Do what you can do even though it is incomplete. The longing for leaving it incomplete will get a full reward inshallah. A complaint that comfort is not received through dhikr. Someone wrote to Maulana Thanwi, Rahmatullah alayhi, I observe some dhikr and recital of Quran and tahajjud too after Isha and thing. But so far, the heart has not received satisfaction. Many people complain in this way that their heart is not cheered and suppose that their effort is wasted or they have some kind of hard-heartedness that prevents the chair, sometimes they lose hope. The divine guidance too is a blessing. The Maulana Rahmatullah said, the mercy is there. The Rahmat is there. Indeed, it's there. And it guides. It guides. The chair, the comfort and the chair and the joy is its auxiliary. And will show up when its turn comes. The meaning is that Allah's mercy and rahmat in the form of inspiration to perform the deed. It is a great blessing. Just that. So appreciate it. As for the chair and the comfort and the joy and the ecstasy. You will get it at the right time. You will get it at the right time. For it is complementary to mercy and rahmat. It will come inshallah. But it is not necessary that you should have it. Nay, not even all your life. But inshallah it will come. Pleasure and ecstasy. There is no doubt that whatever the deed is, that is the real objective. The deed is the real objective. And not the delight or the rapture that ensues. Ensues. Allah. For instance, if performance of deeds brings about the conditions of weeping, delight, etc., then they are not by themselves sought. But if received, if they are received, then that is Allah's blessing. Can't deny that. Alhamdulillah. If they are not experienced, there is no harm also. See, but you must see that deeds are proper. Some people worry very much if they do not get this experience. And we call that what? Hal. Hal. 
They must know that these things are not necessary and salvation does not depend on that. The real thing is whether the part is right and the deed is right or not. That's the real thing. Wow. No weeping on seeing the Kaaba. No weeping on seeing Baytullah. It is imagined by certain people that when one sees the Baytullah, the Kaaba, for the first time, he either laughs or weeps. And anyone who has gone there, mashallah, we thank Allah that Allah has given us the ability to weep. And you wept also to Abdullah. But if one neither laughs nor weeps, then he worries that something is wrong with him. He should know that nothing of the sort is suggested. It is enough that one goes there, sees the Baytullah and makes tawaf around it. That is Allah's blessing and favor whether one weeps or not. And if a weeping sensation takes over one, that is an additional favor. Lack of a weeping sensation is not a sign of, of deprival. The main thing is a right deed. Another thing, you know, you're doing zikr, you're on this part of tariqah, tazkiyah, and then you're waiting for results. You're waiting for results. This waiting for results is an obstacle. A hadith tells us, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ When your good deeds make you feel happy, and when your bad deeds make you feel bad, فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنْ مُسْنَدِ أَحْمَدْ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا said إذا سرتك حسنتك When your good deeds start to make you feel happy, and you get joy, delight, ecstasy out of your good deeds. And when your bad deeds make you feel bad, فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنْ Then you are a mu'min. Some people who read this hadith, Mufti Sab tells us, imagine that they should find pleasure after worship, but what's happening? They do not find it. Now these results do not follow. They don't follow a weight, you know. They don't follow a weight. But as Maulana Tanwi Rahmatullah said, the wait for that is itself a screen. That waiting is a hijab and pardon blocking you. It's an obstacle when you're waiting for that. It can be compared to the, the example, Sallal haiku rakatain. A weaver, a haik, a weaver offered two rakats. So he performed two rakats. One tadhar al wahya. And now we're waiting for revelation. Waiting for wahi. We must not wait for results. For the deed itself is the objective. Suppose you have offered salat. Then there is no need to wait for anything after that. As for the words of the hadith, they refer to intellectual pleasure or displeasure. In other words, akli. Intellectual pleasure or displeasure from your good deeds. If anyone finds natural sentiments coming in, natural sentiments, then that is better, Harun. That is better and it's additional. Salat is the goal. Allah has said, Faida faragta. So when you are free from all your other duties of tabligh and jihad and dars and talim and all these things, Faida faragta, fun sub. Then tire yourself in worship. Stand up. Yani kum fil ibadah. Fan sab. Kum fil ibadah. And nasab also means exhaustion. In other words, tire yourself in worship when you are finished with all these tabligh and dawat and gush and four months and all the other duties. Tire yourself in ibadat. Wa ila rabbika fargab. Tire yourself in ibadah. Meaning what? Make lengthy postures of standing. Let your standing be long. Your qiyam. Let your ruku be long. Let your sijda be long. Fansab. Wa ila rabbika faragab. And let your Lord be your entire quest. In other words, far, ila rab, towards your Lord, faragab. Have ragba towards Him. Pay attention towards Him. Let Allah, your Lord, be your entire quest. This verse 
says that exerting oneself, exerting oneself in salah is the goal. Nothing else is needed. Maulana Tanwi Rahmatullah alayhi has mentioned it in much detail so that no one feels dejected. The impetus to do a deed is a blessing from Allah. That impetus to do a deed is a blessing from Allah. Seek nothing else. The goal is to tire oneself completely. I had described this subject in a poetic verse once. Dr. Abdul Hay Rahmatullah had liked that very much. When we are going on the straight path by Allah's grace, then what is the point in why do we have the greed to possess kashf and ilham? Sometimes people have that greed. I want to get kashf. I want to get ilham, inspiration. I want to see karamat, supernatural things. When we are going on the straight path by Allah's grace, then what is the point in why do we have the greed to possess kashf and ilham? That is knowledge of the mysteries, to see the light, to see the nur, and have other divine manifestations. These things are immaterial. Deeds are the goal, and we have to exert ourselves in that. We must not seek chair, etc. For sometimes, you know, these gifts, they cause harm in the form of arrogance. And you start to think I better than others. One who experiences them may think very highly of himself, so they could destroy you too. Worthy of congratulations. On the other hand, he who does not receive any sensation after doing a deed, though he tires himself doing it, he will not be arrogant. Hazrat Maulana Rashid Ahmad Gangohi, Qadda Sallahu Sirrahu. Now you remember, what you remember now? Gango. Hazrat Maulana Rashid Ahmad Gangohi. Hazrat Maulana Rashid Ahmad Gangohi, alayhi rahma said, Nawwar Allahu Markadahu wa nafana bi ulumihim ameen. Allah. I congratulate the person who never all his life received pleasure in Salat, but yet he continued to offer it. For to offer it in spite of lack of pleasure reflects his sincerity and dedication to Allah. It shows that no personal ambition drives him. So I congratulate such a person. This is why Maulana Tanmi Rahmatullah alayhi said that one should not worry about receiving delight. Rather, one may devote oneself in the task he is engaging. Cheer, joy, ecstasy is complementary to deeds and will show up. It will show up, Bashir. When the time comes for it, it will show up. But don't wait for it. Waiting for it is an obstacle. Without waiting for it. If it doesn't come, then there is no harm because the goal or objective is the deed. And you have performed that. May Allah encourage us to abide by what we have read. Amin. Now, alhamdulillah, all of us are in some form of zikr and we are connected to some sheikh. As I, as I see many people here who are connected to our mashaykh. And this is, chapter is so important. When you do your zikr, how you do it. Some adab or etiquettes of zikr. Maulana Tanwi Rahmatullah alayhi said, There is more blessing if dhikr is observed after performing wudu. So do your dhikr with wudu. More blessing in that. But it is not wajib to do that. Not necessary. If someone cannot retain his wudu and is put to hardship by making wudu again and again, then he may make tayammum. But he should not use that tayammum for salat or touching Quran. And fasi isa. We learn many things from this saying Mufti Taki says, Lamad Barakatuhum. The first is that it is allowed to make dhikr without being in a state of wuzu. It's jais. Allah has made it very easy for man to remember him as and when he likes, even if he has not performed wudu. 
The fact otherwise is that man would not have even had permission to take Allah's name even if he had been in a state of wudu and filled his mouth with musk and ambergris. As the poet says, I may wash my mouth a thousand times with musk and rose water, but it would be bad manners to call your name. Still, who are we to call Allah's name? This is the truth. But Allah is merciful so that not only he has he allowed us to call his name Allah but also place no restrictions on that or on visiting a masjid or on sitting on a prayer rug. Also, one need not have a ghusl, bath or even perform wudu even if one is defiled in need of a farz bath. Or a woman has menses or post-birth bleeding. Then though they are not allowed to offer salat or recite Quran, they may make zikr. And the problem with our woman is once they are in menses, they don't do nothing. But what should be done even though they are there in their menses, when the time of salat comes, they should still sit on their prayer mat. Keep these times and still do some zikr and make dua. Not just chutti, holiday now. Allah has said, Alladheena yadhkuroon Allah Those who remember Allah, Qiyama, standing, Waquda, and sitting down, Wa'ala junubihim, and on their sides. While it is not a condition for anyone making zikr to be in a state of wudu, even though that is there, but it is the demand of love, nevertheless, to be in wudu. There will be more blessings, more nur, and more benefit when you do your zikr with wuzu. Tayammum is also allowed. If a man is handicapped and cannot retain his wudu, then he must not abandon zikr, but he may perform tayammum because there is more blessing in zikr in a state of wudu. He may make it again and again and as many times as it breaks. Know it well that if wudu causes hardship, he may make tayammum. Such tayammum, however, shall not be valid for salat or touching Qur'an. When is tayammum allowed? Those deeds which one is allowed to perform without wudu, but for which he makes wudu out of etiquette, may also be done with tayammum. If a student, talib ilm studies his books in madrasa, then he's allowed to touch them, except Qur'an, Without wuzu, he's allowed to touch them. However, adab, etiquette demands that he should study them in a state of wudu. But if that is not possible, he may perform tayammum. But he cannot use that tayammum to offer salat. The same applies to dhikr. If one cannot retain wudu and it is troublesome to repeat it, then he may make tayammum, which is not difficult to do again and again. But it cannot be used to offer salat or touch Quran. Running away from salat. Someone wrote to the Maulana, I feel much resistance in bringing myself to offer salat. The Maulana wrote to him, There is no harm in that, but do not succumb to the resistance. The feeling, you get the feeling? No harm in that, but do not succumb to the resistance. You should oppose the nafs and offer the salat with attention. And add a few nafil salat in your routine as well, as would not hinder the, necessar the necessary task you do on Fasi Isa. The nafs is always inclined to keep away from pious work. Always remember that about the nafs. It's always inclined to keep away from pious work and to do evil. That is how the nafs normally is. So there is no harm in that. But do not give in to the nafs. Rather, offer salat more dedicatedly. Go the opposite way. Think of Allah. And this is beautiful advice. The Maulana also said, at the time of glorifying Allah, at the time of making your zikr, think of Him, Allah. But if you cannot be constant, then do the zikr as though it's coming from the heart. And Fase Isa. When one makes zikr, he must imagine Allah when you're doing your zikr. Must imagine Allah. A hadith tells us 
أن تعبد الله تورشب الله كأنك ترى أزدوي واسين الله فإن لم تكن ترى and if you cannot worship Allah as though you see him فإنه يراك then know that he is seeing you indeed he sees you so when one says Allahu Allah Allahu Allah Allahu Allah Subhanallah oh Alhamdulillah he must picture Allah before him if you can't picture Allah or the words of the zikr picture the words of the zikr initially in the beginning, when it is not easy to imagine Allah, who is of course cannot be limited or cannot be even pictured, one may simply picture the very words of the zikr, as you see in subhanallah in front of you. He utters, for a beginner, for a beginner cannot even imagine the blessings, the omnipotence and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how powerful he is, Allah. These words could be Allahu Allah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. You can picture these words. Gradually, inshallah, he will be able to picture Allah. Other thoughts. Some Sufis have suggested other ideas while making the zikr. For instance, they have said in the Bara Tasbih, the 12 Tasbih, which is handed down to us through the Mashaikh, the 12 Tasbih. First you do two of what? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. 200 of that. And then there's 400 of what? Illallah, 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 illallah. 400 of that. So the four of illallah should be read in this manner. Some Sufis say this is a good method. Have the idea of La ma'buda illallah in the first. When you're doing your first hundred, all you're thinking about when you're saying illallah, 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 what you're thinking about? La ma buddha illallah, nobody to be worshipped but Allah. To have no, no God, no ma bood, nothing to be worshipped except Allah that is your thought for the first hundred. La ma buddha illallah. In the second, what do you think about? La mahbuba illallah. There's no beloved except Allah. No matter how much I may love something, but you know what? Allah's love is the greatest love, and that's the only love should be inside my heart because the heart was created for Him. Allah's love must be the most powerful thing. So in your second hundred, La mahbuba illallah. There is no beloved. There is no mahbub except Allah. In the third, La maqsuda illallah. There is no maqsud, there is no goal, no purpose, nothing desired, no aim, no objective except Allah. La maqsuda illallah in the third hundred. And in the fourth hundred, la mawjuda illallah. There is no one present, there is no presence, nothing is there except Allah. The trees, the sky, the roof, the ceiling, the fan, everything. Their existence is only possible. Allah's existence is wajib and essential. Only Allah is existing. La mawjuda illallah. For your four, for your four illallah masood. How you go? First one is what? La mabuda illallah. No one to be worshipped but Allah. Second one is what? La mahbuba illallah. No beloved except Allah. Third one? La maqsuda illallah. Nothing is, there is no goal except Allah. And the fourth one? La mawjuda illallah. Dr. Abdul Hay Rahmatullah said that if anyone observes this, then it is right, it's good, right will benefit him. But you know what? It's not even binding on him to observe this. It's not even binding, but it's good. If one recites the tasbih without these thoughts, then, then too that is enough. All that is required is that one should pay a little attention and gradually the aim will be achieved. Sometimes lack of delight is more beneficial. Maulana Tanvi Rahmatullah said, While it is a blessing, it is a blessing to receive delight and cheer in zikr, to not have it is a blessing too, which is mujahada, because when there is no blessing, it's more mujahada. The second blessing is more beneficial, though it may not be delightful, because you do more mujahada. And Fasi Isa, 
If one finds delight in zikr, then that is a blessing, though it is not the goal. And if he finds no delight, then that too is a blessing called mujahada. It is more beneficial because he persists in spite of lack of delight. He endures effort and earns a reward for zikr and another for mujahada. So he's getting reward for zikr and one for what? Mujahada. To do anything against the demands of the nafs is mujahada and to make a habit of it enables one to exercise control over one's nafs. There are therefore three benefits in practicing zikr without receiving delight from it and it is more beneficial. Benefits depend on two things. Mawlana Tanwi Rahmatullah said, zikr depends on less speech, less speech, less mixing with people and having fewer contacts to condition oneself to these things. Study the sermons and the mathnawi, the mathnawi by Rumi. You may not understand it, even though, you may, even though you may not understand it. One of the two things on which a person may derive benefit from dhikr is to speak less, speak less, keeping away from vain talk, vain talk. Sometimes the free going nafs is corrected in this way. When you speak less, and less mixing. A man reformed in this way. A man used to visit my respected father, Maulana Mufti Muhammad Shafi Rahmatullah. He would talk non stop and put question upon question upon question. My respected father was a very humble and polite man. Therefore, he did not stop him, but tolerated his conduct. One day, he requested my father to accept bayat from him as a, as a murid, disciple seeking reformation. He went on, teach me something towards Islam, reformation. My respected father said, if that is so, then I do not prescribe any optional worship or zikr, but ask you to do one thing, prevent yourself from speaking except when necessary. This is your reformation and this is your task. That was too much for him. One who had never ceased to speak. It was as if bricks were applied with a screech. This was mujahada. It worked well on him. The Prophet wasallam said, Inna min husni islam il mar'i tarkuhu ma la yani. Indeed, of the beauty of a man's Islam is that he shuns what is meaningless and doesn't concern him. Inna min husni islam il mar'i Indeed, of the beauty of a man's Islam is that he shuns what is meaningless. He must speak only when it is necessary. The Maulana Rahmatullah said, as long as zikr is not accompanied by less speech and talk, the benefits of zikr will not be received in this world as they should be received. However, they will be received in the next life. He will get it in the next life, but not here in the world here. He won't really get it. I have to speak less. Meet fewer people. Likor nas. Meet fewer people. The second thing is to meet fewer people and have less to do with them. Have less to do with people. It is harmful to increase relationship with people and to mix and mix with them often, as is very common these days. It's called public relations, and it teaches the art of establishing relationship with people. However, to have a wide social circle is harmful in reforming deeds and correcting manners, very harmful, especially in the initial stages of checking the nafs. If you have contacts with others, then that should be only for Allah's sake, even with family members. My brother so and my aunt so and this one so and big family get together and everybody, even with family members. Even with family members for Allah's sake. For Allah's sake. I don't mean that you shun them and you, no, you be with them, this, that, that, but don't spend too much of time and idle talk and gossip and all these things. Greet them, be nice because you must maintain family ties. But to widen the contacts for personal ends, hinders advantages being accrued from Sikr. So, our next thing, shut the eyes, ears, and the tongue. Shut the eyes, ears, and tongue. Eyes, ears, and tongue. Maulana Rumi in the Mathnawi, he said, 
Do three things, says Maulana Rumi in the Mathnawi. Shut the eyes. Against what? From looking at the haram and disallowed. Shut the ears from hearing the disallowed and the unnecessary. Shut the lips, that is the tongue, from speaking what is not necessary and what is disallowed. Shut the eyes, ears and tongue. If in spite of that, you do not see the light and the nur of haq, then laugh on me. He is guaranteeing that you will see the nur of haq. He says, if in spite of that, you do not see the light and the nur of haq, then laugh on me. Subhanallah Bashir. If the benefit of zikr is not received, seeing the light of truth, then that is because that which had to be observed is neglected. They are speakless and mixedless with people. Have fewer contacts. The third thing is to have fewer social contacts. If you have relations with some people, do not turn to them much. Do not go by their pleasure or displeasure. Very important. Don't go by their pleasure or displeasure. Do not worry if the creatures are pleased or displeased. Don't worry about them. I want them them pleased or they displeased. Do not worry if the creatures are pleased or displeased. Work to please the creator and not the creatures. If you possess these three things, then you will reap the benefits of zikr inshallah. How to have them? How may one have these three things? Speak less, less mixing with people, fewer contacts with them. Study the sermons and the mathnawi of Maulana Rum, rahmatullah alayhi, even if the mathnawi is not understood for it's deep. Because Allah has placed some effect in the words of some of his slaves. That's so important. Sometimes a man might say something, but if one of Allah's slaves say the same thing, it has an impact on you. You know the Mathnawi by Jalaluddin Rumi? That whole thing was an inspiration. The Mathnawi is bestowed. It is said, so we should try to get a copy of the Mathnawi. It is said that Maulana Rumi, Rahmatullah had no connection with poetry. His Sheikh, Khwaja Shamsuddin at Tabrezi, Khwaja Shamsuddin at Tabrezi, had prayed to Allah. He was about to leave the world, so he prayed to Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, grant a tongue for the knowledge that you have bestowed on my heart. I want a tongue for it. Grant a tongue for the knowledge you have bestowed on my heart. The dua was answered and Maulana Rumi became his murid and disciple. Allah caused the mathnawi to flow from his tongue, flow from his tongue. Though he had never composed poetry before that. He composed, when he, that duo was answered, he composed volumes of poetry now. Of course, poetry with what? Spirituality. When his sheikh's dua was answered, and that continued, till Allah willed, that's very important, till Allah willed, then he no longer could produce any poetry. After that, he couldn't produce any poetry again in life. In fact, he began, to, he began to write an anecdote, a short story. In the end, started writing that. But could not complete it because the ilham and the inspiration to compose poetry had stopped. So when he had finished the Mathnawi, it's because the inspiration had stopped. He couldn't go on. And that's a lesson for all those who give lectures and who give khutbas and talks that try to talk with inspiration. And that when that inspiration stops, you must also stop. Because beyond that, it bores the people. It, it becomes hard on the ears. And sometimes we don't understand that. Speak with inspiration. Let that be inspiration. And when that inspiration stops, you should also stop. Because he had mentioned the sun has now set. And the mathnavi came to an end. The inspiration stopped. So it was never finished that what he started in the end never finished. Then many years later, Allah inspired Mufti Ilahi Baksh, Rahmatullah of India. Don't look at India so. India has great ilm, great spirituality. India is, India is very famous for the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. India is famous for the ilm of hadith and their contribution to hadith. 
They watch India like that. Even the Arab scholars have acknowledged the contribution of Hadith by the Akabir and the ulama of Dioband in India. Then many years later, Allah inspired Mufti Ilahi Baksh of India with the poem and he completed the final poetry of Maulana Rumi, Rahmatullahi. That is why it is known as Qatmi Mathnawi. Qatmi Mathnawi. So these words were bestowed. Allah. So these words were bestowed by Allah and came on his lips till Allah wished no more. And we must pray for that. That whenever Allah uses us to talk or to give a khutbah or dawat, that it should be words inspired by Allah. These were words bestowed by Allah and they came on his lips till Allah wished no more. There is a special blessing and effect in them which Allah has placed in them in the Mathnawi. That is why Maulana Tanwi Rahmatullahi has advised us to read the Mathnawi, whether we understand it or not, because our reading it will not be without profit. May Allah help us to follow these things. Amin. Wa akiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Social expectation drowns us all inside. What you have should be what I want, cause what I have just ain't alright. The clothes I wear, the way I comb my hair, how I live, oh I don't care. This is who I am, this is me, nothing, everything, can't you see?